expired. Uh, the Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator McKim, which is also shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It is. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whip. And I call Senator Walter. Thank you very much, uh, President. Will I move the matter of public urgency? This morning, my home state of Queensland woke to the news that even though we're only at the start of September, the Darling Downs, the Granite Belt, Maranoa and Warrego are facing catastrophic fire danger. The Bureau of Meteorology reports that temperatures are six to eight degrees above average today. Now, six to eight degrees above average is terrifying. But what do we see from the Albanese government? The fifth new coal mine approved just last week. The black summer bushfires that devastated the eastern states started off much the same way in 2019. And back then, the Greens moved for the parliament to declare a climate emergency, and Labor voted with us. At the time, in opposition, Mr Albanese said that Labor would set their emissions targets in accordance with the science. Well, how times have changed. While our planet is boiling, Labor's climate policies are undercooked. Australia's winter of 2023 was the warmest since official records began in 1910. In the Northern Hemisphere, July 2023 was the hottest month on record as heat waves scorched Europe and North America, and Greece continues to battle wildfires. But back to the Australian Environment Minister, she's just approved a fifth new coal project in my home state of Queensland that will run until 2073. Well, I thought we were meant to be net zero by 2050. That is another 50 years of coal when the science tells us we cannot open any new coal or gas mines. If we're going to stop the world going over the climate cliff, we cannot open a single new coal project, and yet the Labor government have already approved five. Labor has over 100 coal and gas projects in the pipeline, and thanks to pressure from the Greens, we saw changes to the safeguard mechanism that, are make, that make around half those projects unviable, and we will keep fighting to stop the rest. But on top of the confetti of new coal approvals, Labor are continuing to budget for $11 billion of public money each year in subsidies to fossil fuel projects in the form of cheap diesel and accelerated depreciation, including to carbon bombs like Middle Arm and Woodside Scarborough Gas Project. They're also continuing to accept just under $1 million in political donations from the fossil fuel industry in a totally unrelated coincidence. Labor's commitment to the bottom line of their major donors in the coal, oil and gas industry is unwavering. The temperature records keep rising, fire danger is catastrophic and the so-called environment minister just keeps approving new coal mines. It is cooked. Thank you. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, that's an interesting contribution. Yes, we are looking at some pretty intense challenges across the world in terms of climate change. And let's be clear, we've had 10 years of no action, none whatsoever. But we've been crystal clear. The Labor government has been crystal clear in our intentions. We have committed and taken action on global warming, like I say, after 10 years of significant inaction, and we will continue to do so. But what we won't do is close down all fossil fuels overnight because we have a plan to re-engineer our system rather than just destroy our economy and turn the lights out. There is another way, and that way is the way that we have chosen and the way that we intend to progress. It was the Greens' action, let's not forget, 10 years ago, that actively stopped any progression on battling climate change. Just imagine how much better off we would be if there had been support back then, if Labor's climate action plans 10 years ago had got off the ground. Imagine how much better off we'd be now. But no, here we are, starting from scratch. We have the coalition over there laughing at sea level rise in the Pacific failing to deliver any meaningful energy policies over that very long, dark stretch of their time in government. 
They enabled the stagnation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and absolutely did nothing on global warming. And in just one year, the Albanese government has done more for the environment, more for energy, more for water and more for climate change than we have seen in that entire decade. Obviously, it's not going to be enough for my colleagues in the Greens. Um, they are very passionate about global warming, which is great. However, there's a balance here. We have to make that transition. This is about a transition and it needs a plan. Blindly turning off every single system in that fossil fuel chain overnight would destroy our economy. So we need a balanced approach. We need a planned approach. And that's exactly what the Albanese government has done. We started the process by looking at our emissions reductions. Now, Senator Waters has referred to the, um, to the safeguard mechanism, and we legislated that earlier this year. That has been our plan for a very long time. But when you're not in government, you can't, in, you can't bring in those plans. We've just had to sit from the sidelines and watch the coalition government trash the country. So we have a plan, and that plan is what we are rolling out and what we have been rolling out for the last 14, 15 months. We must support our economy and our environment, and our plan does just that. We've introduced a range of policies, not just the safeguard mechanism to start reducing um, emissions reductions, 4.9 per cent every year from those highest emitters. We've also legislated the emission reduction target of 43 per cent. We've doubled the rate of renewable energy approvals because to get away from the fossil fuels, we need another source of energy. And the renewable energy pathway is the one that is right for Australia. We've committed $2 billion for green hydrogen, another form of energy moving forward that will assist in terms of dealing with global warming and certainly dealing with Australia turning itself into an energy, a renewable energy superpower. We've got $1.6 billion for home and small business electrification. We've got $20 billion for rewiring the nation. We have to get those renewables into our system so that our reliance on fossil fuels can decline. And we have commenced the establishment of massive new offshore wind across the country and committed $3 billion to the National Reconstruction Fund. These pathways, these processes are all things that are going to take us to a much better place, reduce our emissions, do our bit. We know that the weather is getting more and more intense. We are in a world of pain here and we need a plan to move forward and the Albanese Labor government has that plan and that plan is what we are going to roll out here to the yawns of the Greens to my right. Thank you, uh, Senator, Senator Macdonald. Thank you. Well, what a load of twaddle, both from the Greens and from the government. This fantastical energy plan that is being rushed is, in, uh, is resulting in greater expenditure in taxes, but no connections, no connections. I've just spent two weeks in Western Australia uh, where I have seen extraordinarily bad outcomes for, uh, for resources companies having to step into the government's failure, the government's failure to actually have any plan at all. But I really turn to this urgency motion that the Greens have come up with because they are continuing to make up numbers in this sector while ignoring the fact that it does continue to provide our energy security. The lessons of the past few months is that energy security equals national security for all Australians. And it's funny that the Greens reference the IEA, however they only continue to pick out the numbers that suit their radical agenda, because coal and gas still remain a necessity for energy production both in Australia and right around the world. It is the International Energy Agency World Energy Outlook Pro that, uh, that projects the total global oil and coal and gas demand will grow. In fact, the IEA confirms that coal and gas will remain an important part of the world's energy mix decades into the future, with coal remaining the single largest source of energy in 2040. And that means that coal and gas will play a vital role in Australia's energy mix 
for the foreseeable future. We can see it in South Australia, in Victoria, New South Wales, the emerging issue of energy supply security and affordability. And all three states are expected to have energy shortfalls over the next three years. AEMO is warning of blackouts and brownouts over this summer, which is a burning issue as reliable power is turned off without proper planning from this government. Coal-fired power makes up 75 per cent of our annual national, average national electricity generation, and gas makes up 16 per cent of that generation and is a vital firming source in winter. We simply cannot afford to cut out new coal and gas developments. Now, we have a choice. Australia has a choice. Do we adopt the European model of outsourcing our energy needs? Or do we adopt the US model of becoming an energy independent nation using our own reserves? Because continuing energy shortages and spiralling energy costs are the result of policies forcing out reliable and affordable energy in favour of intermittent energy sources. And that's what the Greens want to foist on Australian households and businesses soaring energy costs and unreliable supply because Australia's high-quality coal and gas will play an important role, not only domestically, but in other countries around the world. And that is why the Coalition is, is committed to supporting our coal and gas industries, supplying Australia's high-quality resources for export markets to help lift millions out of poverty, as well as providing cheap, reliable electricity to industry and families across Australia. Now, Australian coal is one of the highest quality in the world. We produce it more efficiently than most, meaning more energy and less emissions. And that puts our coal and gas sectors and the thousands of Australians who work in them in prime position to benefit from the increased global demand for energy resources. Because as China and India increase their demand for coal, increase their demand for gas, both for steel creation and energy generation, and Japan and Korea demand more gas to fuel their transition, it is in everyone's interests that it is Australia's high quality resources that are the first choice for our partners around the world. Because our failure, our failure to meet those demands, to refuse to step up and be responsible, those countries that need our resources turn to lower quality higher emitting resources from other countries. So just pause on that for a second. When Australia stops exporting its high quality coal and gas, higher emissions around the world is, is the result. So Australia steps back, world emissions rise. Uh, that is a bad outcome to anybody's minds. And as the middle class continues to grow, Australia's energy resources will enable people from countries like Africa and Asia to lift themselves out of poverty, unlike what's happening in Australia, because it's not the Greens who stress over rising electricity bills, it's mums and dads trying to balance the household budget and figuring out how to survive. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, it's very interesting to hear from the government about the transition. Uh, I'd like to point out that when you transition, you're actually moving away from something. They are moving towards it. They are talking about transition while they expand the fossil fuel industry. This is now vandalism. They know what they are doing. They are destroying our future for short-term profits for a fossil fuel industry that are not good faith actors in this. They are betting on us not taking the climate action necessary to secure a safe future. It is now the extremists who are demanding that we continue to expand the fossil fuel industry, that are giving subsidies for the fossil fuel industry, $1.5 billion for Middle Arm to open up the Beedaloo. I have a real concern about what this is going to look like as we go forward, because currently fossil fuel companies are making bank. They are making record profits. And whilst making record profits, like White, Whitehaven's Malls Creek coal mine, they're stealing water. They admitted to stealing a billion litres of water in the last drought, and the water that was for sale, they're outbidding local farmers. They're saying it's too expensive to recycle their tyres, so they're getting alterations to their um, 
licenses to be able to bury them on site because the $1.7 billion that Whitehaven just made in profit for the last year isn't enough to recycle tyres. So let's just bury them. Let's kick it. That's someone else's problem. We're going to leave this massive hole when we leave and down somewhere will be buried some tyres. The next um, issue we're going to have to deal with is how do we ensure that the major parties are taking this seriously? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, here we are again. Another hypocritical climate change motion from the Greens. They're all about the action on climate change and the environment when it suits their political purpose and TikTok accounts. But when push comes to shove, they haven't got a clue. Never forget that it was the Greens who sided with the no in 2009 to vote down the carbon pollution reduction scheme. I really don't know why the Greens come in here pointing the finger after they helped instigate almost a decade of climate policy failure. I've said it once and I'll say it again, the Albanese government won't be lectured on climate policies by the Greens. And while the Greens continue to do what they do best, and that is being a roadblock to positive reform, the government will get on with the job. As the youngest person in this debate, I understand the critical importance of strong climate policy. I know it's what's needed to ensure a sustainable Australia for my generation and for those to come. And I'm proud that this Albanese Labor government is taking action. Now, the Greens obviously have a hard time understanding good policy, so let me spell it out for them. One of the first acts of the Albanese government was to legislate a climate target. In doing so, we enshrined into law a reduction in emissions of 43 per cent from 2005 levels by 2030 and net zero by 2050. This is bolstered by our safeguard mechanism, which will apply to all large facilities that have more than 100,000 tonnes of emissions each year. I also note that Minister Plibersek was the first environment minister in Australian history to reject a coal project. And the minister will continue to exercise her responsibilities under the legislation and consider the merits of each application on a case-by-case -case basis. Make no mistake, it is the Labor government that is driving Australia's transition to renewable energy. But thanks to the Noalition and the Not-So-Greens, we're further behind than we should be. Those opposite refused to act on climate change for a decade. They repealed climate laws, laughed at rising sea levels in the Pacific and announced 22, yes, 22 different energy policies but landed none. Overturning almost a decade of climate policy failure is not easy, but we're on the right track. The Albanese government has doubled the amount of renewable energy approvals, and we now have a record of 104 renewable projects in the pipeline. In addition, we've committed to $2 billion for, hydrogen, for green hydrogen, $1.6 billion for home and small business electrification, $20 billion for re rewiring the nation and $3 billion for renewables and low emission technologies as part of the National Reconstruction Fund. We've also set up, we've also set up a new Environmental Prote Protection Agency, established massive offshore wind, a massive new offshore wind project around the country, proclaimed 10 new indigenous protected areas, legislated the nature repair market, passed stronger laws to protect the ozone layer, and funded 57 plastic recycling facilities. But above all, we've set a clear path for net zero by 2050 without compromising the economy. Now, despite this government's record, ach record achievements and the fact that the Greens enabled those opposite to launch a decade of climate chaos, they still have the audacity to come in here, point the finger at Labor and post it on TikTok. If Senator McKim wants to blame someone on his social media for climate inaction, he should just post a selfie. 
Like seriously, calling yourself the Greens is beginning to look like false advertising. Because if you really cared, if the Greens really cared about the climate and the environment, they would put an end to those cheap political stunts and get out of the way of positive and progressive reforms. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you. Labor are a bunch of reckless hypocrites on climate. Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek has now signed off on five new coal projects. If we are to avert a climate collapse, there can be no new coal or gas. The science is crystal clear on that. Yet, here we are. People tell me they had hope when we kicked out the cr climate criminals that are the Liberal National Coalition. People tell me they had hope that bold action on climate change would happen. Hope that finally Labour would step up and bring some ambition to the table and act decisively as they had promised. Yet, here we are. This is a gutless Labour government, more fearful of losing their fossil fuel donations than they are of the climate emergency that we are in. Well, the last election was a climate election, and we won. The climate won, because there are more parliamentarians here who want strong action on climate than ever before. Yet, here we are. Every single coal project that you approve hurtles us faster into a future where people and the planet will suffer beyond measure. We are boiling and burning for heaven's sakes. Labour is in government. Stop whinging about the past and take some action now. July was the hottest month ever recorded on the planet. Their wildfires in Canada have burned 15 million hectares of forest. We've just had the hottest winter on record in Australia, yet the Environment Minister is approving new coal. Shame on Labour for trying to greenwash their climate inaction by seeking Pacific Nations support to host COP31. Water is lapping at their do doorsteps. There is a hunger crisis in Africa. Glaciers are melting in Pakistan. Wake up. No more new coal and gas. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Roberts. Thank you. This Greens motion complains that the government has approved five new coal projects this year. Yet the government is not approving enough coal projects. We need to get these mines rolling. And Australia needs this government to approve coal-fired power stations. The Greens like to cherry-pick. So let's look at what else the International Energy Agency said in July. Quote, coal Order. consumption in 2022 rose 3.3 per cent to 8.3 billion tonnes, setting a new record. A new world record. So much for the death of coal. Instead, the Greens would have Australia miss out on the tax revenue from this boom, which funds our hospitals, roads and schools, and saved our economy in the last budget. Order. It's always important to debunk the myth of cheap wind and solar in these debates. Today, we have the highest proportion ever of wind, solar and batteries in the grid, more accurately known as unreliables, not renewables. Just ask any Australian. These are facts. Our power bills have never been higher. While the government sits on its hands about nuclear, building cheap coal-fired power is the only solution we have for the cost of living crisis. The UN net zero pipe dream is already sending Australians broke. And if we don't stop it now, the UN net zero nightmare will send the entire country broke. Unreliables have only increased to 36 per cent of Australia's electricity needs. And look at the damage they're already doing. Yet if you think it's bad now, this government wants to get to 82 per cent in 2030. That's madness. Meanwhile, as Australia annually mines 560 million tonnes of coal, China produces 4.5 billion tonnes, almost nine times as much. And on top of that, China imports more coal, additional coal from us. I congratulate the government on approving some coal projects and criticise them for not approving more. Before we all go broke, Australia needs more mines so we have coal on the ground, on ships, in power stations and in steel mills. Serving humanity. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Well, another day, another coal mine approved by the Labor Environment Minister. And it's extremely disappointing to see this government, who came into power off the back of a climate election, an environment minister who, hand on heart, says this is the moment she is going to take to save and look after the environment. Day after day after day, 
Every time there's a coal mine on her desk for approval, she gives it a great big tick. A great big tick. And every time the Environment Minister approves a new coal mine, an expansion of a mine or a new gas well, every time the Environment Minister approves new coal or a new mine, it makes it harder to save the Murray River. Every time the Environment Minister gives the tick to a new coal mine, it makes it harder to save the Great Barrier Reef. Every time the Environment Minister gives the tick of approval for expanding coal and gas, the threat of Australia's bushfires grows worse. We are heading into another dry, hot season. Australians are already terrified of what this summer will bring. And rather than doing everything possible to stop making the climate crisis worse, to stop fuelling these climate fires, the Environment Minister is giving her big tick to new coal and gas. Our environment laws are broken. The whole point of the Environment Minister is to protect and stand up for the environment. And yet here we have the Environment Minister doing the work of the big coal and gas companies and giving them approval time after time after time. Now, I know that so many on this side of the government wish that wasn't happening. They know it's wrong, but they are fearful to change. It is time to understand, to listen to the scientists, to heed the advice of the world's energy organisations. We can't get the climate crisis under control while we keep making the situation worse. Over and over and over again, the experts tell us that politicians must stop expanding the fossil fuel industry. It is time to stop pouring fuel on the fire. We need the transition and we need to start protecting our environment. Thank you. Senator Babette. Thank you. Now, if Australia stops approving new coal projects, we will not change the weather. Far from it. Of what benefit is a blind pursuit of net zero if it destroys jobs, reduces state and federal government revenue, devastates country towns and lowers our quality of life? Now, the mining industry overall generated $455 billion of export revenue last year. That's almost two-thirds of all export revenue for our nation. How do we pay for the NDIS or how do we pay for social security? How are we going to fill the budget black hole? You can't pay the bills with virtue, unfortunately, because if you could, we'd be paying for it many times over from what I've heard from the people opposite. Now, if the Greens get their way, we will all be broke and we'll all be living, unfortunately, in the dark. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bett. Senator Ormond Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. As I rise to speak to this matter of public urgency, the southern part of my home state of Queensland is on catastrophic bushfire alert. This is the highest warning that can be issued by the Queensland Fire and Emergency Service in anticipation of uncontrollable fires. 21 aircraft and firefighters across the state are on standby and firefighters have this morning been battling a grass fire on the Southern Downs. Just last year, Brisbane saw its second once-in-a-century flood in the space of a few years. For decades, scientists have warned us of the dire consequences of the continued burning of fossil fuels, with successive Labor and Coalition governments pushing off the necessary action into the never-never. We've crossed over from global warming into global boiling. The opening of new coal projects is nothing less than genocidal. The Albanese government is co-signing destruction while swanning about in Rio Tinto merch. We should be throwing the kitchen sink at this before we get to the non-stop catastrophic extreme events, before we get to the permanent destruction of our biodiversity and before we get to the loss of millions of lives. 
Yes, we should be throwing the kitchen sink at this, but instead the Labor government is continuing to pour fuel on the fire. The fringe-dwelling deniers are easy to ignore, but we can't excuse those who know better. Those who have seen the impacts of climate catastrophes and yet have decided to back in opening more coal mines. Every new coal mine is a nail in our collective coffins, and that is unconscionable. Thank you. The time for the debate has expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Uh, ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan teller for the noes.
result of the division is ayes 11, noes 24. The question is resolved in the negative.